here's a here's a good example of what just one text since we're just flying along. Consider the work of God, for who can straighten out what he has made crooked? Nobody. That's his point, right? In the day of prosperity, be joyful. But the, in the day of adversity, consider. In the day of adversity, consider this. In the day of adversity, real, recognize God's lost control of what's happening. That's not what he says, right? In the day of adversity, consider God has made the one as well as the other so that no one can discover anything that will come after him. God has given days of joy and days of adversity. And um, why has he done that? So you can't predict what will come tomorrow, right? Who knows what will come tomorrow, whether joy or sorrow. So what should you do? Fear God and keep his commandments, (laughs) right? Whether it's a joyful day or a difficult day, God calls upon you to do the same thing. Don't, don't think you could calculate what your life will be. You can't. That's what Ecclesiastes is saying. Life is puzzling, perplexing, unpredictable, unjust, and sometimes maddening. So that doesn't mean God doesn't rule. There's no formulas in life. Uh, He doesn't just say fear God at the end of the book. Look at this. Although a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, so there, you know, although a sinner prospers, I also know that it will go well with God-fearing people, for they are reverent before him. However, it will not go well with the wicked, and they will not lengthen their days like a shadow, for they are not reverent before God. I think he's thinking about the future here after death, because he's already said a hundred times in the book, I'm exaggerating, right? He's already said a number of times in the book, the the wicked may prosper and and, uh, and, and the righteous may suffer. So I think he's saying, ultimately, those who fear God, it will go well with them. So many other things we could say about this book. So... um, What else can we say? Just the last theme I want us to look at is Ecclesiastes says, and I think in a positive way, Ecclesiastes says, enjoy life. There's nothing better for a person than to eat, drink, and enjoy his work. I've seen that even this is from God's hand because who can eat and who can enjoy life apart from him? He means that in a positive sense. He's not saying eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. That's not his point at all. Here's another example. What does the worker gain from his struggles? I have seen the task that God has given the children of Adam to keep them occupied. He has made everything appropriate appropriate in its time. He has also put eternity in their hearts. But no one can discover the work God has done from beginning to end. No one can unravel what's happening in life. I know that there is nothing better for them than to rejoice and enjoy the good life. It is also the gift of God whenever anyone eats, drinks, and enjoys all his efforts. So we see, we see that same thing on eating and drinking. Let's, uh, let's go to the chapter 8 example. Oh, it won't let me do that. So he's just said, right, that life is futile. Righteous people get what the actions of the wicked deserve. Wicked people get what the actions of the righteous deserve. So I commend an enjoyment because there's nothing better for a person under the sun than to eat, drink, and enjoy himself. For this will accompany him in his labor during the days of his life that God gives him under the sun. I observed all the work of God and concluded that a person is unable to discover the work that is done under the sun. Even though a person labors hard to explore it, he cannot find it. Even if a wise person claims to know it, he is unable to discover it. So there's the perplexity of life. Go eat your bread with pleasure and drink your wine with a cheerful heart, for God has already accepted your works. Let your clothes be white all the time and never let oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the wife you love all the days of your fleeting life, which has been given to you under the sun. 
all your fleeting days. For that is your portion in life and in your struggle under the sun. Whatever your hands find to do, do with all your strength, because there is no work, planning, knowledge, or wisdom in Sheol where you're going. So, what's he saying? I think Proverbs, I'm Proverbs, I think Ecclesiastes is saying, you can't figure out life. You don't, you, you don't know what's going to happen. The wicked may prosper. The righteous may suffer. Don't worry about trying to figure everything out. Don't worry about trying to make it to, to, to discern what God is doing, but trust God, keep his commandments, enjoy each day as it comes. If it's a good day, if it's a good season in your life, enjoy that. Don't, don't, don't fret. I think it's very similar to what Jesus said. Don't fret about tomorrow. Enjoy today. Enjoy your life. Enjoy your wife. Uh, tomorrow, suffering may come. But, it, but, but don't, don't, uh, don't be full of anxiety about that, but enjoy what God has given you each day. So I think that's a very positive message that he gives. Don't be, be content with the, with the pleasures God has given you in life. I don't think, he, I don't think this is a, a, a call to be a hedonist. <laughs> I think he's just saying enjoy life as it comes instead of uh, fretting and worrying about what is uh, before you. So I think a very practical a very down-to-earth kind of message. Uh, you know, one, one of the benefits, I think, of the Old Testament is the Old Testament keeps us, in a good sense, earthy. You know, especially the wisdom literature, Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. It can, some, some, some Christians, right, as they say, are so heavenly-minded, they're of no earthly good. Yes, I know some people are so earthly-minded, they're of no heavenly good. But, but I, think, I think if we read all of the Bible, we're, we're balanced in that regard. And the Old Testament... The Old Testament connects us to real life, to the stuff of everyday life, to enjoying your meal, a meal, enjoying your life, enjoying your work, working hard every day, uh, enjoying, enjoying your, uh, your wife. But, but I think he is saying, don't think, you know, we pray we'll, we, we pray we'll see great blessing in our life. But, but don't think that you'll necessarily turn the world around. You, you might not. Be content with what God's given you, I think he's finally saying. And recognize, oh, you know, it may, it may turn south on you in remarkable ways. Well, don't be surprised. That doesn't mean God's not with you. That doesn't mean you don't please him. Your job is to obey him and serve him. Anything you want to say there? About Ecclesiastes. Anything about Ecclesiastes? One of my favorite books. Uh, what's a good commentary on Ecclesiastes? I'm trying to think what I used. Most of them I don't like. I do not like... I'm not, I'm not a big fan of Tremper Longman's commentary. He takes a very negative view of the book. I mean, Tremper's brilliant, but I, 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 don't, I don't like how he reads the book as a whole. I'm not. Is it similar to what I'm saying? Um, I've not read it. I should. But okay. it, it is pretty similar. Pretty he, similar. He, calls it, he calls it the Philippians of the Old Testament. Oh, it's yeah. Really it, sounds, it sounds pretty similar, then. Yeah. You know, actually, I list some of the books that influence me in the biblical theology. I just can't think of them off the top of my head. Yeah. So, but that sounds similar. Okay, anything you want to say about Ecclesiastes? Okay, Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon. Well, 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 you know? This is clearly not advancing the storyline, <laughs> right? But a most fascinating book, isn't it? Did Dr. Garrett come and teach this recently here? Was anybody in that class? Mm. He's an Old Testament professor with us. So... The Song of Songs is interpreted allegorically, dramatically, cultically, as a wedding, a funeral, 
a feminist book, etc. I interpret it as a feminist book. I'm just, I was just seeing if you were listening to what I was saying. I do not interpret it that way. You are listening. Okay, good. Thank you. I think it's love poetry. I take it, some people see a love poem with three characters. I, I see two characters. I understand the book uh, as a love between a young maiden and, and a king. And, and what we have here is a royal wedding in the story. Uh, so what we, have, what we have in the book, in my understanding, because there's so many different interpretations out there, but you see the bliss of married love, the bliss of sexual love, right? He, he emphasizes the ecstasies and delights of sexual love. He says it's as intoxicating as wine. The woman is as fragrant perfume who overwhelms the senses. He compares it to delightful fruit. It's compared to the arrival of spring after a dreary winter. Those of you in Southern California, you don't know what we're talking about. But those of us who live in other parts of the country or the world, we've experienced that. After we just had some sub-zero days in Kentucky, we're all looking forward to spring. He's dazzled by her beauty and her sexuality. He, and again, he compares it to delicious fruit and aged wine. Now, I, I just want to make a pastoral comment about this. Some, I've heard some interpreters, no names will be given, but um, I've heard some interpreters, when they interpret Song of Songs, they get very specific about uh, sexuality. Uh, and I, I would argue that the way you ought to preach and teach this is in accord with the, the way it's written. So he talks about sexual union, but in a very delicate, poetic, indirect way. So I, I think that's the pattern we should follow instead of... So I, I'm not thinking of a lot of examples of this, but there are preachers out there who sound rather crass <laughs> the way they talk about what's going on there. But the delicacy and the beauty with which he communicates this, and you see the images we just talked about, that ought to be replicated in our preaching and teaching on the book, I would argue. So in a, in a way, communicating it in such poetic ways is, is far deeper and richer than being what I would call crass. I also, here I agree with Wayne, Dwayne Garrett that what we see going on in this book is the maiden is a virgin and she fears losing her virginity. She's a garden locked and a fountain sealed. He wants to enjoy her fruit. He wants to have sexual union. But she fears losing her virginity in the book. She's haunted by that. Now, of course, many people in our culture don't feel that way in our secular world today, right? But, but, this, is, but we're talk, we're, this, this is talking about someone who's uh, imbued with a biblical worldview of sexuality, and losing virginity is uh, frightening to her. But she, now she belongs to the king. She's given to the king. One of the, one of the key words, right, in the book, which occurs over and over, as young women of Jerusalem, I charge you by the gazelles and the wild does of the field, do not stir up or awaken love until the appropriate time. Don't be in a hurry. Don't be in a hurry to awaken sexual longing. Don't be in a hurry, I think the author is even saying, to get married. Restrain those who are in too much of a hurry. The Song of Songs is a foretaste of paradise. It, it reminds us of Eden. Death is only mentioned once in the book. The bride and the groom are young. Yeah, I'll take a question in a minute. The bride and the groom are young and beautiful and strong. Now, that's not true of all lovers, right? <laughs> but in the book, they're, they're, uh, there's no defect in the bride and the groom. The, their love and their sexual, sexual joys are as verdant as spring with trees budding and flowers blooming. It reminds us of Adam and Eve before the fall. That's, that's quite striking, isn't it? 
What do, what do we learn about love in this book? We learn about the power of love, don't we? Love is as strong as death. Jealousy is as unrelenting as Sheol. Love's flames are fiery flames, an almighty flame. A huge torrent cannot extinguish love. Rivers cannot sweep it away. If a man were to give all his wealth for love, it would be utterly scorned. What beautiful and powerful words those are about the, about, uh, the nature of love. I think it's hard to imagine uh, more uh, uh, poetic and beautiful words about love than what we find here. So love like death is inexorable. Love, love is transforming. Uh, this is what Dwayne Garrett says. I think this is interesting. In some forms of monotheism, there's a dark cellar of guilt and suspicion about sexuality, and sexuality looks up from the bottom of that cellar. This mentality detests the physicality of the human body with all its appetites and excretions. And, and, and Garrett says, Song of Songs is against that. That is, a, that is a substandard spirituality. So Song of Songs teaches us asceticism is not viewed as the pathway to holiness. In fact, the book celebrates in marriage, right, the loss of virginity. So that's, that's rightly understood. Song of Songs c- celebrates sexual union. Um, I mean, I haven't run across this once, but I remember talking to one young married woman, and uh, she, she told me that her mother told her, once you get married, just work as much as you can to not have sex very often with your husband. <laughs> so I, it's hard to imagine a mother giving worse advice to her daughter than that, right? That is not the way of Song of Songs. That's not the way of uh, Scripture. So there's the Song of Songs, now, that's, that's quite, it's quite an interesting book. It, it, is it limited to that? Is it limited? That's the question people have asked. It's a wonderful contribution, isn't it? But is there a canonical contribution? And I want to argue, this is quite unpopular in some circles today, but I want to argue that it's legitimate also to read this book in terms of Christ and the church. Do, do I have exegetical theological warrant to do that? I think I do. Marriage, we're told in Ephesians 5.32, is a mystery pointing to Christ and the church. So, you know, what does a mystery mean? A mystery in Scripture is something previously hidden but is now revealed. So... The relationship between Christ and the church is fundamental, and marriage is, a, is a, a, an exemplar of that, isn't it? So it's not as if, we, we, it ought not to be reversed. We ought not to think first came marriage and then Christ and the church illustrate marriage. I think Paul's making exactly the opposite point. Marriage reflects Christ and the church. So the fundamental reality isn't marriage. The fundamental reality, the mystery is, the, a mystery is something that was not previously seen but is now revealed, right? What is uncovered for us, what is revealed to us, what is disclosed to us is that marriage reflects the relationship between Christ and the church. Every marriage is supposed to reflect that. Well, I think that's true in Song of Songs as well. We already see in the Old Testament that Israel's relationship to Yahweh is pictured as a marriage. And I give you the text there. You're familiar with that. Hosea, right? The, 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 the people of God, so to speak, are married to Yahweh. We see in Revelation chapter 19, 9, the marriage supper of the Lamb. So I would argue that the song, I'm not taking away the per se voice of the, of the book. Clearly, it celebrates human sexuality and marriage. But one thing the book does not reflect on, you, married couples grow old, they die. This is not an eternal relationship. The, but yet, this, the book portrays that love relationship as if you're in Eden, as if you're in paradise. But paradise on earth 
doesn't last forever, does it? So I think the song also points to something that outlasts this life, to eternal paradise, to the greatest love of all. All marriages point to that, finally, canonically. So the, as I say here, the whispers and shouts of Eden point to a joy beyond marriage. I am not arguing for exploiting the details of the song. In other words, I'm not, I'm not appropriating this psalm, uh, I mean this, this song in terms of uh, kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Right? How does that relate to us as Christ in the church? Do you see what I'm saying? I'm not, I, I think that's an air to appropriate it at that kind of, in that kind of detail. I think there's a general relationship of Christ in the church. I don't think the author or the New Testament, hermeneutically as a whole, invites us to read it at, in a kind of detailed one-to-one -one correspondence to every passage. Hey, the church, why is the church locking the door so that if, she, if I'm right about the virginity, the, the church is... The church is locking the door and not letting Christ in. You see what I'm saying? I'm not, I'm not going there. I just think there's a, a general reflection of Christ in the church. So I would, I, would, I would apply it more generally as I have right here instead of trying to get specific because I think that falls into a kind of allegory that's not helpful. So that's my take on it. Anything? I saw one question over there. Yeah. Excuse me. Sorry. Um, First, with the um, main, the, you know, I adjure you, the daughters of uh, Jerusalem, and it says uh, in different translations, uh, it'll supply my love. What, where are you? What verse? Uh, it's 2-7. Um, in ESV, it just says, uh, don't stir up, or that and CSV, uh, do not stir up or awaken love until it pleases, but NESV says uh, that you do not arouse or awaken my love until she pleases. Yeah, I don't see the word my. It's just a hava. You yeah. know? So I don't think, I don't, I don't, that doesn't seem legitimate to me. Oh, it'll be interesting. What does the LXX do there? Oh, let's get rid of the Hebrew just because it's. Yeah, same. Just agapain. No, no a pronoun there. So, yeah. I don't know why they put that in. I, it's an interpretation, I guess. But I, 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 I mean, I, I suppose it's true of the woman, but I, th I think it's more of a general comment, you know? Yeah. And secondly, um, ESV, CSV, they supply the, the he, she call out um, for it. Um, but like NASB, NKJV, NAT, any of those, they don't. Are those... Are those in the original text no. or no? No. They're just helping you. It's because it's tough. So it's, it's, I mean, that's a matter of interpretation. They're just trying to help guide the reader because it's so difficult to sometimes determine what's going on. I mean, I think those divisions are basically right. But, yeah, they can be questioned. Anything else on the book? Any questions, hermeneutical questions? Solomon's the author. Or at least it's about Solomon. You know, so maybe someone in his court wrote it. Um, I would think that at least, at least Solomon or a cohort who wrote it would know about Israel's relationship with Yahweh. And so, I mean, it's hard to prove, isn't it? I suspect that they would say, given the whispers of paradise in it, I think that they would see some such connection. But that's really impossible to prove. 
I would finally base my view. So, you know, this is, this is a huge hermeneutical decision. I would base my view finally on Ephesians 5.32. And I think the New Testament appropriation of it shows that it was God's intention. It's hermeneutically, it was God's intention. But I'm not, so this is very important. Are you all with me? I'm not privileging God's uh, uh, intention apart from authorial intent, but God's intention is discerned in the words of Paul. But I think that what we see in the New Testament is some things, didn't, did I talk about this already? Some things are a prophecy fulfilled and some things are a mystery revealed. Did I talk about this in here? Because I, so um, I didn't talk about this in here. So a, a prophecy fulfilled is something that's directly prophesied and then fulfilled in a very simple sense. But some things in the New Testament says in the Old Testament are mysteries revealed. And if it's a mystery revealed, that's something previously hidden that's now revealed. How, how do we know what's been revealed? Well, through the New Testament itself. The New Testament unpacks for us, here's something that was a mystery, but it's now clearly revealed to us in light of the coming of Jesus Christ. So those two, you, those two we want to hold together. A prophet, we have prophecies fulfilled and a mystery revealed. Why is this important? If it was just a mystery, if it was just a prophecy fulfilled, every Old Testament text would clearly be fulfilled in the New Testament, right? Just like A to B. Or if it was just a mystery revealed, everything would not, nothing in the Old Testament would be uh, clear until we have the new. But instead, it's both. You see what I'm saying? We have both. So we have prophecies fulfilled, but also mysteries revealed. So there's some tension there between those two themes. And it, it, there's, a, there's a call, therefore, to hermeneutical, hermeneutical work, I suppose you could say. Uh, yeah. Don't let me forget it. I will. We're coming to it. Because when we come to the New Testament, that's where we're really going to start to see it. So I, I kind of want to unpack it. So I, the reason I haven't talked so much about this, I kind of want to unpack it with the New Testament authors that we're looking at. Because otherwise, I'm unpacking it a little bit in the air. You know what I mean? If I just start bringing things up, like, well, where did you get that? I want to show you where I got it. Yeah. Uh, this is a book about the beauty of marital love. How do we understand that in view of what we know about Solomon's life? He <laughs> <laughs> well, failed. Life screen, yeah. the demand of the Lord. Uh, and in light of, of uh, chapter 6, verse 8, which mentions other queens and concubines. Yeah, I want to say, let me remind myself of 6 8. Yeah. Well, first of all, I mean, I think the function of verses 6, 8, and 9, I think, I think he's simply saying, you're the best of them all, clearly, right? You're the best of my group. <laughs> so I think in and of itself, I mean, that, that, that's true. I mean, that, that's what Solomon feels about it. But I think when we look at it as a whole, clearly, Solomon, right, I mean, Solomon... Uh, I don't, and if I don't answer your question, come back to me. He, about the king, he must not acquire many wives for himself so that his heart won't go astray. I mean, obviously, Solomon, it's in the Torah. <laughs> Solomon disobeys that. So I don't, I don't think, uh, I don't think Solomon, uh, I don't think what Solomon has done is correct there. And I think in 6, 8, 9, he's simply making an observation, you're my favorite. But that doesn't, I don't think that justifies him having all those wives and concubines. Does that make sense? You want to come back to me on that? A a ask it again. Did I answer your question? Uh, so, so reading the book as the description of something which is different from what he himself practiced, even though he's I, I think, I, I, I think, I think, ultimately, I think ultimately, yes, that's right. That's right. 
he certainly didn't match the ideal of the book. Yeah, I think that's true. It'd be interesting to know when we meet Solomon, we'll have to ask him about that, you know, and say, how did that work, you know? And uh, he'll probably say, I'm saved by grace, <laughs> not by works. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Chapter 5, you kind of mentioned the locking of the door and the little fight, especially verse 7, where the watchman coming and found, finding her and beating her and bruising her in light of the Eden interpretation, like this is an Edenic and perfect situation. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. There is a, I mean, in terms of the love, it's Edenic, but um, <clears throat> I mean, I understand that that passage to be talking about her losing her virginity. Um, I don't know. I don't know what I think about verse 7. I tend to think it's not literal. The, the, I mean, this is very poetic language. I, I think it's unlikely that she's actually talking about being beaten literally by people. But, <laughs> but I'm not sure. I mean, maybe it is. But, so, but since I think the language here is so poetic, um, you know, if we're talking about virginity here, I rose to open for my love, my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with flowing myrrh on the handles of the bolt. Well, I think there she's talking about losing her virginity, not literally touching a door handle. So what is verse 7 saying? I'm not sure. So, yeah, that's a great question. I've thought of, I've never taught Song of Songs separately or preached on it, and I've thought of, I've thought of doing so, and I'd so I'd have to get in more to the specific text like that one at some point. Any other thoughts on that verse? Anybody have? Anybody want to solve that for us? No. Okay, nobody does. Any other questions, comments? This may not be helpful, but I'm really curious about the command of Deuteronomy that the king should not have many wives. No. Um, can we understand that in more than one? Or is it would you say that, you know, what wasn't ideal according to Genesis 2, that God allowed for it? For, you know, I'm looking at David and looking at other kings that had, you know, uh, multiple wives. Like once in a while you'll hear, you know, people ask about that, and I'm not really sure how delicately as pastors we're supposed to, you know, Handle, did God approve of? Did he give consent to, you know, multiple wives for um, I think some I, situations with you yeah, know, relationships I, with other countries? I think that's a good good question. I, I would say that what God did God give consent to? He, in I suppose he permitted it in some sense, didn't he? Maybe permit. But I think what Jesus tells us is he, that uh, it, the, my understanding hermeneutically is ma ma from Matthew 19, some of these things were permitted because of hardness of heart. So that in light of, in light of the creation narrative, God's ideal is one man, one woman. But there are, there are circumstances in which he allowed divorce or, or I, would, I think more wives because of the hardness of human hearts. I, I would not go from that to say, therefore, that's permitted today to have more than one wife. Yeah, yeah. So, which we may be facing that, right? I mean, so, the, you know, I mean, it's, it's very interesting what's come and uh, regrettable, but if uh, all kinds of different relationships may soon be legal, and it may be, people may disagree with it, but it's conceivable that it will once again be legal to have more than one wife or more than one husband, I guess. The Bible says that David was man after God's own heart, and there's Abigail, and of course there's others that seem to have been godly influences in his life. Did God ever approve of that? No, I think he permitted it. But it ultimately it was hardness of heart. When David was a man after God's own heart, but he wasn't perfect. He was still a sinner. Yeah. Yeah.
Maybe just if I can go off that on that verse that David was a man after God's own heart. I'm not sure how much you've looked at it, but do you think that's the best uh, translation of the verse? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, but I, but it doesn't mean perfection, right? Zechariah and Elizabeth walked in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blamelessly. David was like that, but that verse doesn't mean that they weren't sinners who didn't need to offer sacrifice for sins they committed. Same with David, you know. Da but, but I would say David, David's, uh, David's marrying of more than one wife wasn't in the same category, right, as his adultery with Bathsheba and his murder of Uriah because it was something that God permitted, right? So that, that's a, it's a little more complex, which is why I think Jesus says God permitted some things because of the hardness of your hearts. At least that's how I take it. Yeah. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, it says, it is good for a man not to use a woman for sex in the CSB version. Yeah. How do we reconcile that with song songs? Well, that, that translation, that translation means you ought not to use a woman for your personal selfish sexual gratification. That's what that translation means. I actually... Now, so there was a committee there, right? I don't agree with that inter translation, by the way. Uh, to, but, you know, that, that translation is defended by Brian Rosner and Roy Champa in their First Corinthians pillar commentary. And I just wrote a little, and I, when we looked at it in the committee, I wasn't sure, but I just wrote a Tyndale commentary that's coming out on First Corinthians. And as I looked at their evidence, I, I'm not persuaded. I'm closer to the NIV on that verse. But, but what they mean by that is not, it's wrong, 1 Corinthians 7.1 doesn't mean that it's wrong to have sex, but it's wrong to use a woman for sexual gratification as an object. That's what, that trans, that's what they're after in that translation. Which, of course, I agree with the idea. It's just whether that verse is making that point. 